Today on the Wrinkled Engineer podcast, Justin, Kara, and Dylan join me. We're going to discuss a theoretical house and the optimal air conditioning system that we could use. We're going to talk about how we got into engineering. We're going to look at some Mandalorian costuming and some of the techniques that Dylan uses to make them look awesome. Finally, Justin's going to share some words of wisdom after having just finished a season of coaching peewee flag football. Welcome to the Wrinkled Engineer podcast. I'm Gates. I'm here to my left with Justin and to my right with Kara. They are both uh, mechanical slash plumbing engineers. Um, so not structural this week. We're not going to be talking about structural engineering too much. So that may be sad for some of you. But um, I've, been, I've been thinking about the house that I want to build for a while. Well, since I was little. And part of the problem I have is considering the air conditioning. And, and the cooling of that house because I have several different competing requirements. Uh, one, I like to be comfortable. To me, that's the most important thing. Um, two, I've got a computer room that, that has like 30 hard drives that spin 24 seven. So the idea of keeping that room nice and cold without having to cool everything else down to that, to that level uh, would be nice. And then I also have my shop, which needs to stay, you know, low humidity, but doesn't need to be cold most of the time, only when I'm working in it. So, Justin, I sent you a, a text with a, a sketch of like an 1,800, 2,000 square foot habitable house right. with, a, with a shop. As opposed to an uninhabitable yeah, house. Yeah, well, yes. Um, with a shop attached to the garage that's like 600 square feet. Okay, and your uh, air conditioning in the garage. Yeah, yeah, air conditioning in the garage, though, just to like that 80 degrees to make it comfortable. Yeah. It's not 100 degrees I, in your I car. I feel like you should have dreamed bigger, but go on. I'm trying to be reasonable, and, I, and I've been thinking about this house for a while. Um, and then like a 50 to 100 square foot tech room that's got the server and everything in it. Um, and so my structural engineering brain about a decade ago figured the way to do this was obviously thermostats in every room. That uh, So you know the temperature. So at night, you can drop the temperature in the bedrooms and raise the temperature out in the living spaces. And during the day, reverse it. The other challenge I have is that my house is almost never empty. Mm -hmm. We always have people in the house almost every hour of the day. Um, so... I was looking at louvered options mm -hmm. where when the thermostat kicks on, it opens the louver to your room and allows more air in. I was thinking very physically about how this to solve, is, solve this problem. It's a very structural engineer solution. I, I, it doesn't you know, exist. But. And I, well, and I would love for it to... Well, I was going to be homebrew. I figured I could, yeah. I could make this work with just thermostats and the call wires, and, and it would work. But ultimately, yeah. I'd want more There's, control yeah. than that. So where you start off wrong is if you get like a standard like house piece of equipment and you have uh just it, it all does is throw air out right so if you put a damper on these different dampers and your thermostat and it starts closing it slows the air down you put yep. wire across the coil and you, i don't know if you've ever frozen a coil before. i've seen it, seen it right? in so commercial that units that would happen because you got the air moving you got a lot of air uh you got air moving slower so it's getting colder it's getting colder the humidity sitting there and then it gets colder and it starts short uh, cycling it down so not not the best idea especially then and then because the thermostat the unit would still operate off of like one thermostat mm -hmm. all these other ones would just control damper so it, that's not really a solution unless you I, right i think it would have it would have been cobbled together and not worked yeah. very well and i guess the, the initial premise and and correct me if i'm wrong that the most efficient air conditioner would be an air conditioner that ran 24 hours a day, and the heat lost matched the heat pump output, right? So it just kept everything in perfect equilibrium. Well, that's what they, the, the theory of like a, a VRF system, like for big buildings and you're a moderate climate, you know, half the, half the building today, the sun's on, they're hot, they're starting to get, they start to, they start to need cooling, but the other side of the building hasn't seen the sun, and it's a big enough building so that they don't need it so that all the refrigerant goes back to a v, the VRF system and they have their own internal heat exchangers so in theory that's that's where the vrf comes in okay but they don't really make them small that's what i'm saying you should dream bigger right because <laughs> the bigger you get the easier it is to do it well it's getting there right because 10 years ago when i was thinking about this it seemed like those systems were non-existent except for industrial yeah. scale like, yeah like huge commercial buildings and mm -hmm. now those packages are getting mm -hmm. smaller and smaller for you know smaller office buildings and things like that so Taking that premise that a small unit that can round robin rooms is more efficient than a larger unit that handles all the rooms at once and then turns off for a yeah. period of time and turns back on, 
what's what does the setup look like? What does the hardware look like to create a system well, that I'm describing that gives yeah. me point control in each room, but is efficient and <laughs> yeah. works well? So the most elaborate one would be what they call VRF, which is the variable refrigerant flow, which is you got a big central condensing unit. Now, I don't think they get down to like, your, the house you're describing is like a four ton house, maybe four and a half to five, depending on how much stuff you put mm -hmm. in there, because you put a lot of crap in your house. But <laughs> a lot they, of heat load. <laughs> yeah, I'm full of hot air. Hours. I'm not full of hot air is the problem. Yes, there's that. There's one, you talk a lot. And then two, there's the, <laughs> the server. Not, not many houses have a home server running 24 seven. So you have to count that. So you might be on the five ton range. And it, mm -hmm. it, really, if I remember correctly, I don't do, generally don't design systems that small, but seven and a half tons is really where the VRF starts to kick in. You get this big central one, central uh, condensing unit, all the units go back to it. Now, the, the issue you have is every single manufacturer does it differently. Samsung has some smaller stuff where they have different ports and you can run, you just run your copper right to the condensing unit and you mm. have multiple ports for multiple units and everything happens there. So there's a manifold at the unit. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, but I think that's smaller. Then you have something like a, a Mitsubishi where they actually have it at all the two lines that comes in, hits the and heat it just exchanger. just circulates the entire house. Yeah, well, it hits the heat exchanger and all your pipes come off of that. So that's where you get the, you know, this room's heating, this room's cooling, and it's, you know. Um, so, so you get some efficiency you gain. You get some efficiency there. By I mean, moving around the energy from one room to another, basically. Potentially, if it's running. I mean, if it's warm enough and it's still running, um, yeah, you could. I mean, but the, the bigger, the bigger thing you would gain there is with the with that kind of system and some of the other systems they have is that the um, it, you get the individual units right instead of having that big condenser big unit in, in the house you have big unit outside multiple small units so when one room's is set at 80 like I think you said you want to have your shop that's not running right? mm -hmm. so there's some savings there and then if there's if it's just your wife home and your kids and their kids in the bedroom and your wife's out in the living room, those units would run. And then the other rooms don't need to run because they're not, they're not nobody's there. There's nothing going on at that set point. So that's where it would get, be. I mean, I think the, I think the problem you ultimately always will run into is price, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's a pretty elaborate system <laughs> for a home, but it's what I would, if I, if I'm building my perfect house, it's bigger. Yeah. what you dream but it's also <laughs> your mansion your estate yeah, my, yeah okay. the, the grand estate that you make off an engineer's salary and um yeah, i will mention justin's a design manager <laughs> so we have different expectations of reality <laughs> i'm supposed to be more grandiose right? but, uh, <laughs> so so basically you're looking at one large unit or, one large, or one several large, yeah, smaller have, units can you split those into multiple rooms or yeah you'd have one, would it be you'd zoned have, they, that would be the zone you couldn't. The zoning is in the refrigerant okay. line. So you'd, okay. you'd have one condensing unit. If it, On a smaller scale, you can do four units, I think, off of one small unit, like the suitcase style unit. Um, and then you could have maybe multiple ones of those, or the ideal would be the big unit. So you have one unit, one condensing unit still at the end of the day, or maybe two if you need two systems. And then you have your air handlers on the side. So what does the... So it's ductless, right? So we're not, we're not running central air from a heat exchanger in your garage. That connects to the cooling unit. Mm -hmm. your, your your heat exchangers in each room. So what does that look like? What are the options? Is it is it a huge thing hanging off my wall? Is it buried in a ceiling now that it's got to there's, be extra there's, deep? There's different options. Like you know, the typical one you'll see is the thing hanging on the wall, mm -hmm. right? I don't like the way that looks. So okay. <laughs> and then they have the other ones where it's kind of a, a two-way throw. It kind of like, looks like a diffuser, like a square, a square diffuser. You stick that in there, and like the unit sits above the okay. ceiling. Um, and then the other options are uh, ones that you can put like up there, but they're with two, like a one-way blow, and they just go across the hat room. So that'd be mm -hmm. more equivalent to like the diffuser you'd see mm -hmm. in the ceiling of your house. Okay. So that, that would be likely what you go with. They they're starting to make ones where they have one that they always sell, and I've never seen anybody use it. It's a <laughs> it's a picture frame, and you can put your own picture. Oh, in that's it, and it's but it's actually a conditioning unit. So if you what picture would you put in a picture frame, Kara? That's a duct <laughs> or an air conditioner. <laughs> I mean, it should at least be an LCD so that you could flip through it, load up a bunch of pictures on. Maybe right? you can do that. I don't I mean, know. I mean, I'm sure it's out there. I'm, I'll be honest. That's not the 
I never yeah. thought about that. I'd want it to just be a, a, like a blue to red color to tell me what the temperature of the room is. And when it's on, it turns blue. And when it's off, it's, it's a very it's red. specific one. Yeah, I don't know. need. Okay, so so barring cost, but it's, I think the market's going this way, right? As, as I think ultimately the energy code kicks in and yeah, trickles down into the residential market. Yeah, I think I think it's going that way. Um, you know, eventually it'll get there. I mean, it's it's one of those things where right now it's it's simpler to do it. I mean, the other thing you're going to find is a lot of the, the labor to install it. Those things get can get messed up, but they're not that hard, but, you know, people just aren't familiar. So, no, okay. Um, well, I do it all myself, so <laughs> as you well know, I, yes. don't, I don't like to pay people to build things for me. It <laughs> feels wrong for some reason. Um, all right, cool. So so it's doable. So It's, do it's doable. Uh, you start budgeting now. Yeah. yeah. So, that, so that's a big chunk of the, the building cost, but... Ultimately, you should be saving quite a bit of energy because you're cooling your needs, yeah. not cooling everything. Right, right, and it depends on how you use your house and everything. I mean, you, you know, Florida foam bill down here. I think we talked ours about the same. It's like three hundred dollars in the peak of summer. Yeah, summer. You know, when people are home during the day and they don't want to go outside, and you know, <laughs> getting that humidity out of the house, getting the humidity out because they're afraid to leave the door open. <laughs> I don't know. It might just be my problem, but. Uh, Anybody with kids has that problem. <laughs> yes. So uh, I think that that'll start spiking it and run it. So you know the it, but so you get three hundred dollars a month. I think you got to look at the fact that you know maybe you save a hundred dollars in the peak months and then you save a little more in the winter because you're not going to have to run much, especially right. down here. So, so what happens as as you hit a peak capacity? So it's a hot day, mm -hmm. and let's say rather than having a seven ton unit, it was more reasonable. It was like a four ton unit for. A two thousand square foot house, and seventy five percent of the house needs cooling. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just the system just degrades slowly, right? It's just not cooling as fast, or is it because it's pulling more the, heat with the, the regular system or the, with the VRF? VRF, or is it spinning up and actually cooling down it, to it, a lower it's, point? It's size too. Like when you typically, I mean, if you have a bigger unit, you size it like one hundred twenty five percent of the indoor load to the outdoor load. Okay, for a smaller one like a house. You probably wouldn't do that. You'd probably go one to one because there is going to be time in the summer where everything needs everything needs cooling no matter <laughs> what. So yeah, it would just crank up and it run. I mean, they have the inside there. You know, instead of like having that on off compressor that you hear like kick on, mm -hmm. I, I it would I, just be the fan, right? The, the fan kicks on, but the it's got a compressor. They got a compressor on it, but it's a scroll compressor, and it, it can ramp a little bit. So, okay. On the more elaborate ones, not necessarily the ones you get. See, I, I would want. I would want like a priority list I, so yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. my no, kids' no. rooms go offline if my room's getting too hot. <laughs> <laughs> like I think that's the it should be a priority list, okay. and the person paying the bill should get priority on the cooling. I just don't give them a thermostat. Oh, there you go. We'll control More it. Air. Turn it off on them. Yeah, yeah. that would, <laughs> they would enjoy their fans. I'm sure. Instead, all right. Well, cool. Thank you for that information. I hope I hope everybody learned something because being a structural engineer, I I know these two do things with mechanical systems, but I don't really care about it. <laughs> until I have to support it on a roof. Um, so it's good to know. So I wanted to talk about how you got into engineering and how you chose this particular path. <laughs> and I know That's my story good. is very different than Justin's story, but mine's atypical, I think you'd agree. Yeah. Uh, what's youngest to oldest? Sure. All right, sure. Kara. All right. How did you decide on MEP, mechanical plumbing, fire so the MEP was more chosen for me I got into <laughs> really you didn't have a choice on this okay well so I got into engineering I was always really good in math and physics and the sciences I am incredibly squeamish and would have died in any sort of anatomy class so that was out of the question and I don't really enjoy teaching other people <laughs> I my explanation methods are pretty atypical okay. and very unique, as Justin can so attest. This was just the last option was going engineering. <laughs> I really wanted to do like physics, theoretical physics, but it's I than communications. That's the, that's the real default. <laughs> Sorry, but I didn't want to teach the rest of my life and just work on one thing. So I started off in mechanical engineering, kind of with the eye, with my eye toward the sky. Like I wanted to actually work NASA, airplanes. I have a fascination with airplanes, rockets, all that stuff. And so I generalized in mechanical engineering, 
got a couple internships doing drafting over the summer. I was kind of that that CAD person that they always say, oh, just give it to the intern. <laughs> I was that person. And then one day I landed an internship with an MEP uh, company. And here I am. The rest is history. Do you like it? I do. What's your favorite part of the MEP to work with? Fire protection slowly getting up there. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a very unique beast, and now that I'm starting to learn the codes and understand the codes a lot better, now I'm starting to enjoy kind of doing that design work. And I guess my, my issue is not with fire protection engineers. They're some of the best engineers I know. It's the fire code that makes me cringe a little bit, and I have some reserved thoughts about it. It um, makes me cringe, too. I will not, too. not share it this time. I've winced, I've cringed, I've cried, you know, all that. Yes. Well, you work with you work with Justin. I think you're younger than me, right? So, uh, am I? Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, barely. So, uh, yeah, mentally, you're a lot younger than. Yes, I am. emotionally, yeah, very so, young. So, how did you come about mechanical engineering, oh. specifically mechanical engineering and building systems? So that was uh, that's a you know in high school, you know, when you're trying to pick a major, they're like, here, here's this book. And have you seen those books? Mm -hmm. them? Through. Took a little test, filled yeah. out some questions. Well, yeah, and obviously I did good in math. I did good. I did good in pretty much everything. I wasn't a very enthusiastic student. Um, are, are you enthusiastic about anything? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. Just depends. Just think it's a rare. It's, it's a rare it's shade of your character. Life grinds you down. <laughs> but, um, the uh, the so I had two classes in class, high school that I actually really enjoyed: architectural drafting, and engineering drafting. So I found a major flipping through the book that said architectural engineering. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty cool. Let's try that. What's that about? So I did a little more look into it, and there's only 16 schools. So one, that helped kind of narrow things down. Then uh, it turns out I wanted to, well, and then I applied to Penn State and Drexel. Penn State's the original. It's not, I didn't plan this. Penn State plays Ohio State. <laughs> More. <laughs> so I do like that. I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of their program. But they started the architectural engineering program, and they taught everybody else, and they all struggled to keep up. And I say that for the internet. And everybody okay. There. Right. <laughs> but uh, Penn State, you know, the architectural engineering program. So I went up there. I met with the guy, um, and I, you know, when you start, you're just a general architectural engineer, and then you have to pick a discipline after your. Seems like a juxtaposition of. <laughs> architectural engineer. It, well, you can't yeah, make up your yeah, mind. Yeah, well, well, our, that's what to me. Our architectural classes, maybe, <laughs> I don't know if it's the right time, but the architectural classes were not what the architects did, and they hated us for it. <laughs> so, but the, um, uh, the, so you go there, you have to pick three options like construction management, electrical, mechanical, or structural. So I, uh, I, I wasn't sure. I actually tried to change major second year, <laughs> thought about dropping out second year. Stay, decided to stay, and then I, mechanical was the one I liked the best. Lighting, electrical, I was, I didn't like the lighting. I don't like structural; it's boring. It's very boring. Concrete. It's just a little advanced for you. No, it's boring. <laughs> this, two things going together. Are they going to fall? Probably not, because you oversized it. That's um, right. That's right. So, uh, so yeah. So I picked mechanical, and then I actually grew into enjoying it, and and. Uh, Got internships and all that crap, and here, here I'm at. Here you are, <laughs> thriving in my career, of course, as someone say, or whatever. Awesome. All right, so I guess that leaves me, the structural engineer, the the oddball, I guess, of this this panel. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be a commercial electrician when I was a kid. Swing and a miss. I, well, I thought that would just be <laughs> really fun. Like it seemed like a cool career. You work on big equipment I, and. It does. I mean, yeah, it's probably more fulfilling. Yeah, and I, I watched a lot of like home time and uh, Norm Abrams wood shop and stuff as a kid. So I saw these like things mm -hmm. getting built. I didn't watch Bob Vila. <laughs> well, was that like a specific thing? Bob Vila? Yeah. What? I mean, like no, like why didn't you watch him? I just didn't like the guy. So, like that's an odd. I, I had a I had a Tim Taylor from Home Improvement image of Bob Vila as a kid. <laughs> he was just a host. He didn't really ever do anything, like you know. But Norm Abram built stuff, so 
that's what got me interested in construction. And I felt okay. like a commercial electrician was probably something that would be very hard I, on my body when I got older. Well, I got to this age. <laughs> and it would be difficult to continue doing that kind of work. And that, that work is fun. I don't think I'd want to get into like superintendent level type stuff. I'd want to, I like doing the work. Uh, so when I was about 10 years old, the alternate to electrical or being an electrician was designing buildings. But I knew I didn't want to be an architect. I wanted to deal with the physics and the math and uh, the structural side of things. So I, I was 10 years old and I figured out I want to be a structural engineer, which I think is a little, that's a little unusual. Odd. It's odd, but I'm an odd person. I still wasn't sure up until about 25, 26. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I had a few dream jobs that I, 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 about when I was 12, I started to figure out where I really wanted to focus my structural engineering work on. And, and I, I've been working ever since about that day to, to do what I do um, now. Um, so I, I do feel like I fulfilled my goal in life um, working as a structural engineer. Uh, it's a challenging road, though. Um, yes, as Justin pointed out, it's really simply keeping things from falling down. Um, <laughs> the intriguing thing about structural engineering is that uh, when you mess up, people can die. And lots of people can <laughs> die. Uh, mechanical engineering, you mess up, and we just don't have... Heat, heat and air conditioning yeah, and someone gets legionella. Yeah, you there can, are some diseases like, when you, you don't kill design. People if you really want yeah, to. But, really, I mean if you set your mind to it, you can do anything. But it's a little more difficult that you know Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna drop steel on their head. Right. So that's that's what intrigues me is that that inherent uh, understanding of risk and hazards and So are you uh, like so when you're calculating things you're like instead of do you have any safety factor? Like, ah, no safety factor. Let's, let's I, let I, I let's do what see. the code tells me to do, but um, no, it, it's Living it's understanding that that no system's perfect and that it's all statistics. Mm -hmm. That even if it's designed per the code, there's still after three or four deviations a probability that something could go wrong. Um, <laughs> so that's it helps me live my life the way that you know in that same manner that things can go wrong whether you plan for the best or not so you realize how different yours is compared like <laughs> Kara didn't like blood and she didn't like t kids <laughs> she became an engineer I didn't know what I wanted to do and you're like at 12 I knew I was gonna be a structural engineer well so a, let me ask very you this. unusual am I not a focused person with respect to my discipline <laughs> To a fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're you're like you're a structural engineer. Like that's like yeah, that's what I think about. As Tim and I talked on the first podcast, the key characteristic of structural engineers are arrogance. That's yes. the most important aspect. I said that recently. Somebody So uh, without any context, somebody said some was holding him something against the structural engineer and said he was he was <laughs> condescending and I said they all are. Every single <laughs> one. There are a few exceptions. I would never but, hold that against a structural yeah, engineer. Most just, engineers are. Yes, okay. and structural engineers just really, they, yeah, they take it, it to I mean, all the other level. That's you get your black belt in the condescending. <laughs> yeah, so that's my story. I spent way too much time in college to get through my program, but, you know, if I had to do it again, I'd hopefully make it through quicker, but it is what it is on that. All right, now we're going to talk about something that's really cool, really fun, um, a little bit, not something adults would normally do. Sorry. Not something I would normally do. I don't understand the obsession, but I, tons of people are into this, so I get it, um, that it's cool. And pretty relevant right now. It is very relevant because today, well, Mandalorian came out this week. So Kara and her husband Dylan, so Dylan's going to come join us, um, both like to do the whole costuming thing. Yeah. Not just wear them, but make them. Oh, yeah. make them, wear them, so, play dress up. Yeah. <laughs> See, I don't understand it, but I get it. I get, I, I get that this is a thing. Uh, so what do you got for us today? Well, uh, me and her are actually part of an international costuming group called the Mandalorian Mercs Costuming Club. Uh, it's a fully licensed uh, not-for-profit, and we costume for charity. So specifically Mandalorian? Specifically Mandalorian costumes, yeah. And uh, for those who live in a bubble. Uh, Mandalorians is a, a race of people from star, the Star Wars universe who okay. get to wear cool T-shaped helmets. And, and which uh, characters would we know? Um, Boba Fett, Jenga Fett are the arguably the two main Mandalorians. But now there's a third. That but now there's uh, yep, Din Djarin from the new popular uh, Disney uh, series, The Mandalorian. Cool, cool. So what do you got? What what do we? 
All right, well, what are we talking? What are we really talking about here? So, we have this is a the helmet that I've made, uh, nice. just a typical uh, Boba Fett style helmet, T visor. And this is Kara's. Yes. This is actually Kara's. Yes. We should have made you wear it for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, and then no, uh, this is a uh, using a method known as a uh, slush casting. It's a uh, an equal parts A and B liquid resin. That we then combine together, mix, and then dump in a mold. Okay, so it's an epoxy yeah. type of type of. And then here. here we have the mold right here. I'll, I'll use a uh, the cups and I'll dump the cups in here, re resin, slosh it around, cut all the helmet, and then after uh, a few minutes, you know, you know, 10, 20 minutes, I can demold it, and then I get what's known as that. Cool. So how does how do you get that? This is um. <laughs> here, let me. <laughs> Known as the because uh, that seems like the genesis here is yeah so it's made of two parts you have the inner silicone layer layer known as the mother mold and then you have the outer rigid layer which is the um, the shell which keeps everything rigid oh, that's just fiberglass just this this is fiberglass yeah there's a few different methods um, you can use a uh, other companies make hard rigid layerings that you could put on but um and then you uh you dump your resin in there shake it around and then it's all bolted together. Um, around the helmet and you just remove that and then you basically just peel the silicone off the helmet up onto itself. And then you get a nice helmet that you can then paint and spend another. So what, what does it look like when it comes out of the mold? Is it smooth? Is it? Um, the outside is smooth and if you do a good job, so is the inside. <laughs> Sometimes um, depending if you're, you're not, you don't move it enough or you wait too long when you're mixing the resin up and it starts to cure. So then you'll get like lumps on the okay. inside and it'll be lopsided and it won't be nice and smooth. Very cool. Yeah. So, so what's the, and then the finish is paint, but I mean a lot yep. of sanding or priming or is it? Um, a lot of, you know, you get uh, hit it with some like can, three. airbrush? You can use either or. A lot of people will use rattle can, airbrush, get you that, it's like extra mile, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this helmet after uh, that's been cast, it only needs very light sanding for okay. like paint to adhere, or, uh, whether it be airbrush or a rattle can. So one of the things I know Dylan does really well is these, the aging. Of, of the props, making it look yep. weathering, make, make it look like it's old <laughs> and it's been used. Oh yes. So bring that Kara's helmet back out. I guess show us some of your your weathering on this that makes it look like she was actually yeah. So fighting. Um, it's a very tedious process because you first sand the whole helmet and then you're gonna prime the helmet with a uh, like a neutral color like gray or white primer. And then what you'll do is you paint the whole helmet silver. Or whatever, where, you want to reveal. or whatever you want to reveal silver. And then you'll use a type of masking fluid. There is a latex masking fluid, or you can uh, use toothpaste, or some people I've seen use uh, condiments like uh, mustard. <laughs> Just uh, you know, you'll paint it on there, whatever you want the damage to look like. And then you'll take your main color, spray that main color on. So you just need something that's going to come off easily. Exactly, yeah. Um, the, with the masking fluid itself, it, the paint doesn't cure on the masking fluid. It stays soft, so you basically just wipe it off, and then there you have your detail revealed. You have your primary color, and then you have that chip away to uh, your uh, the damaged or the metal color underneath the helmet. So it gives it a layer. It gives it a more three-dimensional effect, makes it look lived in. So you're putting, rubbing dirt or anything like that, or dark uh, spots? Or? Black wash, okay. or a, uh, basically just a wash. It's uh, acrylic paint and water. So you'll then so you know, can get stuck in the corners and stuff. Exactly. Like, you wipe you it just off. put it wherever you want, leave it on for a few seconds, take a paper towel, wipe it off. It can you do that with any black colors or um, earth tone colors just to get like grit and grime to make it look lived in and, and used. Very cool. What's the visor made out of? The visor is a Hobart face shield. Uh, it's a, actually a welding face shield that I cut down. Oh, cool. So you've got the nice tint to it, but you can still see. Yep. Yep. It properly obscures the face so you can't see the wear inside, and then you can see really well out of it. And partially obscures the wearer's vision inside. Yes. <laughs> you, have, you have, I have no vision to my lower left and right, which is perfectly where kids like to sit. Yep. They come up to you and you stick right there, you try to walk and you bump into them. So, yeah. so this is only a piece of Kara's costume, right? You've got yes. a full kit. Oh yes. So what are the reactions you get when you wear this, Kara? And what events have you gone to? So our big event is MegaCon Orlando. That's usually where we're there for the whole weekend. We've done parades before. 
we've done uh, archaeologists for autism up in Merritt Island, birthday parties, weddings, pretty much you weddings, name it. Really. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you name it, we've been there. Um, at, so there's two reactions we get. People either are like, oh my goodness, Mandalorian, Star Wars, or we've been called Power Rangers. Um, we've been asked if we were... the purple color. Yeah. <laughs> we've been asked if we were from Fortnite before. That was, that was the most hurtful one to me. Yeah, that one was the most <laughs> hurtful, yeah. But, you know, it's people either know who we are or don't know who we are. And I think now with the Mandalorian, now mm -hmm. a lot more people recognize yeah. that T visor. Yeah, the iconic yeah. T visor is like Mandalorian. I'm like, yes, thank yes. you. <laughs> At I've, least Star Wars. Yeah. I've gotten the Hulk before. Yeah. So my predominantly red and black kit, mm -hmm. what, what we call the costume, a kit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I get Interesting. That's very cool. So any other fun characters that you guys, other than Mandalorians, that you like to kit out for? I have a Ray. I oh. also mask around as Ray. Yeah. Um, we made Sabine Wren from Star Wars Rebels for my yes. little sister. That was a nightmare of a paint job. Yeah. <laughs> We used airbrush for that, and I have, um, if you know what Sabine Wren looks like from the Clone Wars, very, very intricate and was at very, the point. Very colorful. Very colorful and above my <laughs> level of expertise. Yeah. Had to learn quick. Uh, right now, we're also working on a stormtrooper. Yep. We have all the pieces. Now we're just kind of fitting them to us yep. and putting the whole costume together. Trying as close as we can and make that a movie accurate, even mm -hmm. implementing the same techniques they used to put on the armor and attach the armor to the person in the yeah. original trilogy. So I'm seeing you got hard edge um, fabrication, you've got mm -hmm. the more organic shapes, but then with like a ray costume you got to get into sewing and that seems mm -hmm. like a whole different trade. It, it, it is. <laughs> sewing and makeup. Yeah, I am not great at sewing. I'm trying to get her more into sewing, so. Yeah, you, you started me off on sewing yeah, and I've kind of taken it. I've made like flight suits. Uh, I made some parts array, other parts I sourced out, which is fine, but I'm learning, slowly learning. Yeah. It's a fun process and I'm also learning how to do makeup because a lot of characters require, face characters require makeup. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about Mandalorians is you have a helmet on <laughs> and yeah. don't need makeup. Don't need to worry about what my face looks like for pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though we still smile behind, yeah, you, smile behind you the still helmet, smile yeah. behind the helmet. Or make faces, stick your tongue out, you know, no one, no one can see. <laughs> Very nice. We'll have to get some, we'll, we'll add some pictures that we'll get from you on here. But that's cool. Well, Dylan, Dylan thanks for, for joining us. We'll, Thank you for having we'll me. We'll look forward to maybe some more more tips oh, yeah. on this, this stuff. Because I love the fabrication process. I may not like to dress up, but the, the idea of making things that look authentic mm -hmm. um, and the best best place to copy that is from the movies, yep. you know, yeah. and they oh, yeah. have very authentic things. And what's nice is you, you have an image of what you start with. And so when you make it, you know whether you achieved your goal or not because exactly. it looks the same. <laughs> so it's a good metric. So I, your work's awesome. I, that's oh, thank very you. impressed thank you. with looking at that. So cool. Um, so Justin just finished a season <laughs> the raw, yeah. of, I mean. of Pee Wee flag football. Yeah. And so, so I wanted to get some life lessons from Justin. <laughs> I don't know about I don't about this. Uh, how old were the kids? Seven and eight. Seven and eight, and your your son's on the team. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> that'd be really weird. I don't. <laughs> it'd be really weird if you're coaching. Just I, I can see. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that's not right. Maybe, unless you're a professional pee wee coach. It's flag football's different. You know, who's like if you don't have a kid and you're coaching flag football. If you're coaching like tackle, like there's something <laughs> to build to there. You're not going to. You mean real football as opposed to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ones where. So how was your season? It's awesome. <laughs> wow, that's completely different. The conversations I've had with you over the last two months no, have been very different. It was, uh, you know, it was my first time. I've coached baseball before, and I was the assistant coach, and it was seven and eight year olds. So it was like uh, same to, thing, right? No, 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 no. Seven and eight. I remember coaching baseball. Now the other guy, I had a lot more enthusiasm than, him, and then he had. He was a very enthusiastic guy, and so maybe that enthusiasm is. You know, infectious, and it kept the kids interested. Um, I don't know that I have that anymore. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm an effective <laughs> coach. You know, and they said we don't keep score. You're We're a design not, manager. I hope you're an effective coach. Uh, Just of adults or those who yeah, I talk, look like I adults. Mean, care am I great at talking to people that work for me? No. <laughs> like, I'm the wrong person to ask, though. Let's be honest. So.
I yeah. think there are a few people who would say you're good to talk to. I'm just... to th- I could talk. I could talk, but I, I don't do well when I'm annoyed. Uh, That's so... true. <laughs> Which happens a lot. Yes. I, I'm the most annoyed person in the world. Justin's the most grumpy person I think I've ever met. So we make a pretty interesting... And I'm yeah. here to even all that out. Yeah, yes. so she brings balance to Which the force here. She's she's testing the theory of if you can be a good engineer and be happy. <laughs> and I don't believe that's the case. Now, <laughs> so taking it back to fly football, I, I, I uh, you know... So I, they did. They had um, my son play last season, and he had like eleven kids on the team, and that's you know it's it's hard for kids to get to play last and all this stuff. So they sent out an email and said, "Hey, anybody willing to coach? We we if not, otherwise we're gonna have like eleven kids on each team." And I was like, "Well, I don't want that because I want every, my, I want my son to play more, and I'm assuming other kids want more time to play. So I'll I'll, I'll volunteer." Oh, the goodness of your heart. It, it was well, good. In, it was it was good intention. It was well, mostly selfish for your son. I mean, I'm thinking of my son, but I'm assuming most parents want their sons to play football. Nobody wants to come and sit there, watch your kids sit on the bench. So, um, so I and I and I tried to stick to the, um, you know, the everybody plays an equal amount of time and they get to try different things. So I tried to keep that, and uh, so and they, they don't keep score. We don't do this. I mean, everybody keeps score, but they don't keep score. They don't keep threes. But we're gonna have playoffs. And we're gonna rank the teams. And uh, it's like college football. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. And I, I and I knew it was coming, and we got ranked last. And it hurt my feelings because I, I was like, I don't know. Uh, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing. I mean, there's not too much to keep. You know, like shuffle your feet, stay in front of the kids, pull the flag, catch the ball, throw. It's basics, basics. So I thought I was teaching them that, but it's not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not communicating. You weren't running up the, I'm like the scoreboard. No, no, no. We were good on defense, though. Very good on defense. Uh, offense struggled to move, <laughs> struggled to score. So now, when I've had to deal with youth sports, the parents have always been what drove me nuts. But you told me your parents were I, were wonderful. My parents, I didn't have any problems. But with the parents. kids. <laughs> The kids, I, I don't know, like, I, you know, so, like, when I go, taking it back to baseball, what I expected, everybody was, like, paying attention, focused. You know, some people would, like, slip, but, you know, like, hey, mm-hmm. get there. I would run plays, and, I mean, there was bodies on the ground because <laughs> kids are, like, wrestling, and then somebody goes to throw, I'm, like, get the ball back to the center, let's practice, run another play, just practice, throw the ball to the center, somebody plays defense on them, they crack their heads together, and I'm, like, guys, you can't do that. We're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. <laughs> But your son, your son listened to you, right? No, no, no. And I, there were several times where I told him, "You have to be, you can't not listen to." I mean, he was better. He was better, or above average in, in listening. But I don't know. I, that's what I realized. I, I was like, I don't know what to do in that situation when like these kids are like, I don't know how to, I don't know what to do, and I'm like, you can't yell, you can't. Hit them, obviously. That's not... We're past that decade. Yeah. Right? A little bit. A little bit past Your own that. son, you could... A <laughs> little do that. it. <laughs> no, I don't do that. But uh, So I don't know if there's any life lessons there. I just know that I'm not a great coach. <laughs> well, that's a good life lesson. <laughs> um, don't try. Do you stay away from, from Pee Wee coaching now? Or is I, that... Uh, I, well, I'd signed up my son for a spring league, so I said uh, I'll maybe be assistant coach. <laughs> you can bring the snacks and, uh, yeah, and yeah, take snack. role. I, I mean, I, I would do it again. I just uh, maybe. Oh, I will tell you, it has been quite entertaining to come in on Monday morning and have Justin explain the horrors of the weekend football games or during the week after practice, just the – consternation that exists when well, you're trying yeah. to deal with children yeah i'm just trying to you know and then obviously this is an engineering podcast right so they don't teach you that in engineering <laughs> and i don't know that we have the capacity for it yeah it's not day to day it's not a thought in my head so i was like i would do it again i would probably do it again but it's it's I don't know how you, how do you keep kids or and then you want the the funny thing is the guy next to me he looks over he looks over at the other team that's practicing and all their kids are like doing the drill exactly right and sounding off in order do, yeah they're doing drills he's got them going he's got them shuffling their feet he's got them like going up downs warm ups and 
back, like all the shuffling and, and, and like almost like ladder drills, and they're all doing it in unison. And he just looks at me, he's like, that makes me sick that they're like, like they're doing everything. <laughs> you're doing everything perfectly. So I was like, it's clearly. It's you. It's possible. It is possible <laughs> for them to listen and do it. I failed. So I got to figure out that fail. We're, we're working on it. You know, we're going to study the tape and see what, see what we can do better for next year. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Well, any any last words? I think that's a good note to to leave off uh, on. Uh, for for you know this uh, you know don't coach. Don't coach. Don't coach don't unless coach. you know you're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words. The trouble is it, you're qualified to coach if you're willing to do it. That's <laughs> why uh, I don't volunteer. Kids need volunteers. Right. Don't don't listen to me. I'm an idiot. Again, I'm the Rankled Engineer, Gates, Justin, Kara. Thanks for joining us. Have a good one. Mm-hmm.